Okay. Um, if not, I'd like to get started with the pre-training and pre-trained LMs. Um, this is Xiang, who we've introduced before. He'll be lecturing this time and next time, and then uh, another time in uh, another time or two in the future. Um, he's an expert on uh, all kinds of things, but in particular, like uh, training and instruction tuning for um, kind of LMs for complex tasks like coding and math. Uh, so, or sorry, reasoning and math. So um, he's, you know, knows a lot about this topic and is a perfect person to teach this class. So um, please ask any questions yet. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm super excited to teach this class. Uh, definitely, I'm not as knowledgeable as Graham. Uh, this, is, this is true. But like, I'll just try my best to teach like what I know uh, for this class. And it's also my great honor, you know, to teach the most gradient students in this world. Uh, and Okay, now let's get started. So this um for this class, we're just gonna talk about the pre-trained and pre-trained language models. And uh, um so um and again a brief introduction of me. So I'm a postdoc working with Graham. Uh, and my office hour is on Wednesday, 1 30 to 2 30 p.m. And uh, my office uh is at GHC. 64, 16. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, no matter whether it's related to the class or just related to just some general research ideas you want to uh, like explore or discuss with me, feel free just to come to my office to discuss. Um, and yeah, so uh, before talking about like the pre-training uh, and pre-trained large language models, I'll just maybe give you a brief recap of what we covered in the previous classes. Like firstly, we uh, in the previous classes, we mostly talked about the language modeling. We know that we just use a, a probabilistic models to kind of, you know, uh, you know like just modify or just uh, to kind of estimate the, the probability of a sentence or document uh, using this function px. So x could be a sentence or document. Uh, and we can just use a, for example, we can use a generated model that calculates the probability of language. Right, and then we talk about like different kinds of language models, and one of them is autoregressive models, as you may uh, know about. Like Llama is definitely one of the uh, the autoregressive language models, and you just cover and to uh, do some uh, real things around Llama in your assignment one. So basically, for the autoregressive language models, um, the objective is just like okay, given the context uh, or the previous token. Like we aim to predict the next token. So we just model uh, the probability of given this context, the blue part, and predict the, the, the next token, model this kind of probability. Um, uh, and also, I just want to give you some uh, very detailed recap about the next token prediction. Um, so basically, the next token prediction is something like it's still like a classification problem, right? So basically, we can think of like the language models or neural language model as kind of some classifiers. And we basically just classify the prefix of text into V classes and V is just the vocabulary. Um, and when we just predict the next token, we just kind of, you know, select the, the, um, the most likely token from the, the, the V words or from the V tokens, V is our vocabulary. Um, and to be more specific, for example, um, given a sentence say, I saw a cat on a, so basically, we just feed this kind of prefix into a, a neural network, which is usually a transformer. And we can get the representation of this prefix or the history. Uh, and then we can have some linear layers. Basically, we just project this kind of embeddings into V, uh, like V tokens. And then we do the soft max and uh, something to like that. And basically, we just modify, OK, given this, I saw a cat on them. And then what is the next word's uh, probability? And basically, we can just train our model to kind of predict the next token uh, in this fashion. Um, okay, so that's basically the recap of the previous classes. Um, and basically in this class, we will cover mainly cover talk about like the language model, large language models pre-training, um, where we will first talk about like pre-training data, and then we talk about the some uh, important training setups, um, you know, especially like talk about some important hyperparameter setup, talk about like how can we do the parallelism to enable the large scale training and so on and so forth. And then we will just talk about like the open source or the, the, the open source large language models versus closed source large language models 
And we just also talk about some representative uh, large language models in this class. Uh, again, this class, may we may have a lot of like thing to cover in this class. So it, I would just, maybe for something, I, I won't have time to talk about the detail. But if you have any questions, uh, you can either like just interrupt me and I could try my best to, to answer the question uh, if time permits, or I, I can just, you, you can just come to my office and I'll just answer your question offline. Um, so basically still, we, uh, to start with this class, do you want to utilize Llama as an example? Cause you know, um, the Llama is kind of a very important representative of open source, uh, large language models. Or maybe open weights to be more to be more accurate. We, we will talk about that concept later. Um, but basically, so for this is a kind of an overview of a typical large language model training. Uh, and this figure is taken from the the, the Lama two paper. Um, so basically, I think typically people classify the the training into three stages. Uh, the first one is do the pre-training. Uh, basically, you know. We have a large pre-training data, which is just a large scale text corpus, uh, usually from web. Uh, and then we just do the next token prediction or the so-called self-supervised learning. And we just let the model to learn how to predict the next token. And in that fashion, we can just pre-train the um, model uh, like on this kind of large scale corpus. And finally, we can just get the base model. And this is Lama 2. And in the second stage, uh, we do the so-called like supervised fine tuning or SFT. So you may hear about uh, this terminology before. And that's basically like, okay, after the, the, the pre-training, we might want to align our model to some you know, well-organized or st more structured output um, with you know, maybe some human written data or some high quality uh, supervised fine tuning data. So that's the reason why it's called like supervised fine tuning. Uh, and then we got somehow got a, you know, a instruction to model and sometimes we just call it a chat model. Uh, and because, you know, there might exist some, some harmful content, for example, or some biased output from our models. So we basically just want to further refine this model to better align with the human values uh, so that, you know, it just, we, we just require the model to output something we want, not just, you know, some, 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 some bad thing. So that's basically, we, we introduced the, the, the third stage, which is you would call the RLHF or reinforcement learning from human feedback. There are kind of variants in this stage. For example, people may directly utilizing the so-called like uh, like EPR or something else. You may you may have heard about this terminology before. But basically, the still like at this stage, the high level idea is like how can we leverage the human feedback to further improve the model so that you know we can better align the model with uh, the human value. And we will definitely talk about the supervised fine tuning uh, in Thursday class and the RL thing in later classes. Um, and sometimes people just say, okay, there's, there's just two stages. One is pre-training and the post-training. And post-training just mainly covers the uh, supervised fine tuning plus RL thing. Um, and I more recently, you know, there are, like there are another stage, which is people just call mid-training. So if if you care about you know some like some large number models uh, like recruiting opportunities or something yeah you could say oh we are recruiting like me training uh like researchers or engineers so i feel this name is kind of i don't know but like basically in this stage people just want to you know add some training like in the middle of pre training and 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 and, and fine training or post training basically maybe at this stage people still want to do some large scale training though not in the pre-training that large, but still like it's far beyond the, the, the fine tuning stage. So that's the reason why they call it like the, the mid-training stage or something. Um, yeah, so firstly, so when, when I first heard about the pre-training, um, I actually found this name is a little funny because like why it's called a pre-training? Because pre-training, whether pre-training is training, yeah, definitely pre-training is training, but why it's called pre-training. So actually this, this concept just came from the, the, the bird model, I think. Like basically um, in the, um, so in the bird model in, in like 2018, so like, like because previously people just trained their model specific on the downstream task corpus, uh, but in the bird paper, um, researcher proposed a paradigm which basically, okay, before we training on the downstream task corpus, can we just, first do another round of training, which we call the pre-training, like as comparable to the real training or the fine tuning. 
So yeah, so that's basically why like we have this kind of terminology name. Though right now we have like different kinds of training stages. Uh, that's the reason why people call it mid-training instead of like free, free training. I don't know. But like, yeah, that's that's just a name. But uh, yeah, that, that, that that's just come from like, because uh, people just want to do some fine tuning. So they just have another name called the pre-training. Yeah. So then I just talked about like the some pre-training data sets. So as we briefly um, mentioned just now, like basically in the pre-training stage, the model um, is trained to predict the next tokens. So uh, as you may know, so in this stage, we need a very large corpus, which usually, you know, some unlabeled text corpus. And people usually get this kind of large scale corpus from the web. So uh, common crawl is definitely one of the most important sources we can use. And, but besides common crawl, there are also some other sources available from the web we can use. For example, like later on, we'll introduce like how to, you know, train a code generation model and definitely we'll use a lot of code data from GitHub. Uh, and we also, we will also uh, like, usually we also like have the archive or some, like stacks train or Wikipedia or books uh, adding to the pre-training data corpus so that you know we can just get a very diverse mixture of the pre-training data. Um, and here is an example of Lama 1 pre-training data mixture. Um, basically, they have 1.4 training tokens in total, and they just cover um, the, the 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 data sets or the data resources, uh, data sources as just mentioned. Um, and this table also give you some overview of like how large is really a pre-training corpus. And basically if you can check out the disk, uh, disk size, I will also cover in the next slide. And basically just will take you like four to five uh, terabytes to store these trading tokens. And you may also uh, saw like in the um, like third columns for the epochs, basically for some corpus, for example, for the Wikipedia and the books, we train them with multiple epochs instead of one. That's probably because like for those kind of data, uh, data sources, they are higher quality um, than, than those on the web. So that's basically, we just want to repeat it for multiple times. Um, so yeah, so even though we know, okay, we have trading tokens for the pre-training, but still I just want to give you like some statistic of about like how large are like one training tokens. So for the physical size, so say if we want to print out these uh, like one trillion tokens uh, on the papers, basically like a typical page contains about like 300 to 500 words. And you know, uh, assume we have like one trillion tokens. So that basically means we roughly have like um, 750 billion words. And if we have like an average of like 400 words per page, that's about one point a75 billion pages so that's basically if you want to print out all of these tags uh, on the page that's we will we will have like around like two billion pages uh, and if we just utilize the digital storage uh, I just briefly mentioned we will have around like four to five terabytes of storage and if we utilize the reading time to kind of measure the how large of one training tokens basically say, okay, the average reading speed is about like 200 to 250 words per minute. So time to read like 70, uh, three, like 750 billion words is like will take a, a single person like around 7,000 years of continual readings. Um, so that's a lot. So if you want uh, our human beings, I just study all of these text corpus available um, online or just utilize to train, pre-train a large language models, it just will take you like seven, like 7,000 years to finish the reading. Um, but that's a very interesting point. So maybe, uh, I don't know whether I have time to talk about, but I, I will just briefly mention this because I've been thinking about this, this risk, like interesting question for a while. Like, you know, for our human brains, we're actually, we are kind of bad at memorizing things, but we're really good at, you know, like finding the patterns behind the data. So we force our brains to kind of, you know, learn some patterns 
from the data and then we memorize the pattern instead of memory the data. But for the model, it seems that they are very good at memorizing the real training instances, but not but are kind of bad at generalizing uh to you know some un unseen things. But yeah, just anyway, uh maybe we don't have time to cover uh this kind of thing. But if you are interested, feel free to ping me. Um I have I have one extra comment, which is there are like benchmarks that try to tackle this. Um like there's a benchmark called the ELM uh that is essentially looking at whether we can train models that are good with a similar amount of linguistic input that humans get. So um, this this is obviously like way more than any of us have seen in our lives. So obviously something inefficient is happening here, but. Cool. Um, yeah, just pause a little bit to see whether there are any other questions. Yeah, sure. It's really long. Maybe kind of more difficult to make benchmarks just because you don't know like is part of the model. Right, right, right. That's a very good point. So people, so uh, that's a, we, we call, when, when, uh, like that's a terminology we call like the contamination. Oh, oh yeah. So the question is like, okay, if we train um, like, you know, large, we can, we, if we just use very large scale training data from the web, then perhaps, you know, some of the benchmark data sets or data samples are also including the training. Like how can we measure the performance like more fairly or more accurately? So I think that's a, you know, like a widely acknowledged issue um, in the community and people just try different kinds of ways to kind of avoid this kind of data contamination issue. So we call it data contamination. And basically a, a straightforward way is just to remove your test set samples from the pre-training data set. And there are also some other ways like try to, you know, mirroring like how similar or like how or what is the probability of a, a pre-trained model knowing your test samples? So people develop different kinds of approaches to kind of avoid this kind of data contamination issue. And I think we will talk about more in our evaluation classes, where basically we just talk about like different kinds of evaluation benchmarks and talk about like how people uh, develop different kinds of ways to avoid this kind of data contamination issue. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, then we'll just briefly uh, talk about the tokenizer because this is also, um, this was also covered in the uh, last class. So as we uh, know that, so if we want to like train the model to predict the next token, basically we just want to first convert our corpus to the, uh, to, you know, the, the tokens and we just use tokenizer and we have, we talked about like different kinds of tokenizers, but in Llama people, uh, or like in most of the, 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 uh, the typical lockdown models right now, people more utilize, um, the so-called bad prior encoding algorithm in, uh, either like built with sentence piece or with, uh, with some other kinds of similar libraries. Uh, and basically the, the, the high level, like the, of these kind of bad just incrementally the most frequent uh, token pairs. Um, and for the architecture, we also covered uh, in the last class. Um, and basically, you know, the backbone is kind of a transformer uh, architecture. Um, but in Lama papers, they just made a, a few uh, changes, which kind of lead to more stable training. So for example, they just use RM's norm to, uh, to replace the original layer norm. Um, and I think we also covered the LX norm uh, in the last class. If uh, you, you forget about details, you can just refer to the last class. Basically, just remove the the mean uh, or the average uh, value of the, the, the in the in the norm uh, norm layers. Um, and then we will have the active function three GLU instead of the ReLU. Um, and we will also have a a new attention mechanism, which is we call like the GQA or the group attention, and we just cover in the next slide. And we also have the row position encodings. So basically it, it's a, a more advanced encoding algorithm that can better capture the absolute and also the relevant uh, like positions of, of tokens uh, in one sentence or like in a single training sample. Um, so basically group query attention. So basically uh, I may I may just talk first say talk about like the multi-head attention. So for the multi-head was typically used 
in the standard transformer models. So we have like queries, keys, and values. Um, and we just do the dot product tension between uh, different query and keys, right? And just we do the tension maximum and aggregate the values. Uh, and later on, people find, okay, can we just, you know, be more efficient? So we have the so-called, like, the, the multiple query attention mechanism. Basically, you know, we just use one key or one value to kind of, you know, uh, sorry, one key and Y value to, to kind of uh, do the uh, amount multiple queries. And in that way, we can just, you know, all of the query can just do the dot product with this key, a single key. Um, but, you know, in that way, we may, you know, sacrifice some accuracy of the downstream task. Okay, then people say, okay, can we do something in the middle? Uh, that's that's the, the so-called, like, the group query attention. So basically, you know, group attention, instead of share a single key or value half, but instead it just, you know, uh, group the, the queries, and for each group, they just share the key and, and values. And here's a like a, a table that summarizes you know the the latency or the, the inference time latency or the inference time uh, speeds and the average performance like on some typical uh, downstream task or benchmarks. Um, and as we can see for the uh, GQA in the last row is basically like for the like the the time inference or the inference speed. It's pretty fast, but meanwhile, it still like keeps the the, the accuracy uh, for the downstream task performance. And just for context, I probably should have mentioned this last class because this is about the llama architecture. But Xiang reminded me that I had forgotten to mention this, so this is another important part of the architecture. But at least thematically, it should have happened uh, mm -hmm. maybe last class. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then we just talk about some uh, other setups which. Uh, you may say, oh, there's just uh, some like hyperparameter setups which are not important. Um, but um, unfortunately, these are very important, I think, like in your like practical training. Because uh, a lot of like junior students working with me, I found like they just like very like of, you know, the, the real training uh, experience. Basically, they typical, they also, they, they, they usually ask me like, what is the best hyperparameters you recommend to train a model or to fine tune a model? So I think it's very good to like to kind of learn some typical setups uh, in the you know very uh, well known models uh, training process. So I just have this single slide to mainly talk about the hyperparameter setups because you know if you don't have a very good hyperparameter setup, which will lead a very unstable training or even that collapse. So. Okay, let's maybe uh, have uh, like let let let's see this table. So basically, you know, for the number one, uh, they have four sizes. Um, smaller one is like seven B or six point seven B, and larger one is like sixty five B. And for 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 each model, they have like different kinds of dimension and n hats and n layers. So um, but for the for the learning rate and batch size, you may find like they just use relatively use the large batch size, which is kind of very important here. Uh, because you know, during the pre-training, uh, like people usually want the model or want the training to be very stable. So they found like like utilizing a, a large a relatively larger training batch size. Like for example, here they use like four million tokens, like like per batch size. So the batch size here is like the global batch size. It's not just like the, the macro or mini batch. So the, the, the global batch size uses like 4 million tokens, which is really, uh, which is relatively large. And they just found like utilizing a large uh, training batch size will lead to a uh, very stable training. Uh, and for the learning rate, so basically you can see uh, it's usually like uh, 3E minus four, this level, uh, or sometimes 1.5E minus four. Uh, and when you do the fine tuning, maybe like you just like utilizing a much smaller one, maybe just use like a one e minus five or something like that. But during the pre training, it's minus four. This 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 kind of level. Um, and for the other setup, uh, I think the call thing scheduler is important, and also like the VDK grading clipping, and also as well as a warm up step uh, steps. So warm up step is. It's kind of let your model to, it's also another kind of strategy to make your uh, training more stable. And also uh, people find like utilizing a scheduler with warm-up steps could lead to better performance compared to the constant learning rate. 
yeah, but anyway, I think this I just give you a, a a brief overview of this setup. Again, I think this practical setup is very important in the real practice. Um, so, but again, if you have some time, just you know, do some real implementation and training, that will definitely be very helpful um, for you. Um, any any questions? Yeah. Is there a formula on? how to scale the dimensions as they go up. Like, 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 like it's the 6.7 billion driver model has a dimension of 4,096. Uh -huh. The largest one has 6,100. Then is there like a formula? Yeah. So the question is like whether there's kind of mathematical formula to get us like how can we set up the the, the dimensions or n hats and n layers when we you know uh like training a model from scratch. Um, I mean like the, this kind of uh setup is usually uh combined with your hardware. So for example, why people want like kind of those like seven B or maybe thirty two B this kind of thing is basically like okay. It's just related to like how large uh, uh, NVIDIA GPU's memory size. So they basically want to, okay, maybe for example, for the for the 30, 32B or the 34B, why people just want to use this size is this reason because it's like um we can just fit this model uh into a single uh like 4090 GPU uh NVIDIA GPU. So that's probably the reason why people just design this size. And I definitely think people have some formulas to calculate this or like in general. Uh, but uh I actually don't find it. Maybe, maybe there are some formulas, but I, I could I could look them up offline. My my impression is that it's largely like they kind of linearly scale all of them. You can see how they're they're kind of linear, except maybe the layers are bigger than the heads. Um my guess is this is kind of heuristic. Mm. It's like they had a target mm. target size of model, target size that could fit on GPUs and stuff like that, and they just followed that. Um, there's a really interesting paper called The Case for Co-Designing Model Architectures with Hardware um, that is related to what uh, what uh, Xiang mentioned, and it, it talks about how like CUDA, uh, sorry, uh, NVIDIA accelerators like particular sizes of models. Um, it, so if you're really interested in that, you can take a look at it. But I think it's kind of heuristic. And mm -hmm. like most other things, you'll want to follow previous precedent mm -hmm. when you start doing it. Mm -hmm. Sure. Is that right on the, can you give me the one more test? One more thing? Sorry, I don't hear your question. Can you elaborate on the uh, warm-up test? Oh, what, what, is, what, what is one up fact? So yeah. basically like, so, so the question is like, uh, like what is a warm up step? So basically, the warm up step is like, okay, say our like learning rate is set to uh three minus four. We are basically like not just start with this kind of learning rate, but instead we kind of like let the learning rate uh linearly climbs to the to the maximum learning rate, and then we sort of like the learning rate to decrease to the uh to 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 the final learning rate and here the final learning rate is like 10 percent of the maximum learning rate so you will say if you plot your learning rate uh you will have like something like this so something like that so and this is kind of your uh like the 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 mix of the warm up steps and see if this is like the pre dotted steps. Um, and this is kind of the see, this is the uh, 10 percent your maximum value rate. Um, any other questions? Sure. Uh, so, kind of related to that, but how many steps would you train the models for? So, like, what, what percentage of the steps is the performance step? Yeah, so the question is like, uh, how many total steps we will have? So maybe we can do some basic uh, basic math here. So basically say we have one trillion tokens for the pre-training and we have the batch size of four million tokens. So we can just use like one terabyte like divided by four. So it's like, so we have one trillion tokens. So it's like 1,000 million tokens, right? And 
you just oh sorry this should be no this should be the six show and you have minus four and you have like 250,000, 20,000 total. So that's all I think. Wait, so you only train for- For one epoch. So, okay, you only train for one epoch. Mm -hmm. okay. So like, yes, so when we like, talk about like the number of tokens we, we train on, uh, usually we just talk about like the, the whole training data instance we will have. And we may have like, we may repeat it several uh, training corpus for multiple epochs as we introduced in the previous slide. Like for example, we like have like two point, we repeat the Wikipedia for more than two epochs. Um, but for the others, we may have like some half epochs or, or just one epoch. So it's just like this so-called like data mixture. But when we mention the total number of tokens, we just mention like how many tokens in total we are we train our model on. Cool. Um, yeah, and then uh, the next question would be like, how, how to train the model with a GPU cluster or multiple GPU nodes? So again, I think this is quite important because like uh, maybe at school, we don't have like too many resources to let you like to train your model on like a real big GPU cluster. But still like, I think if you got some chance in the future, definitely you want to try like how to train the model with multiple GPU nodes. And here in this class, I'll just uh, briefly talk about the techniques behind the these kind of training strategies. So first I just talk about like two training libraries we have uh, that are widely adopted or commonly used. So first is a deep speech, which is uh, you know uh, constructed by Microsoft, and it's a deep learning optimization library that makes distributed training easy, efficient, and effective. And um, people, if you just use transformer libraries or I mean hugging face transformer libraries, you you may find that the deep speech has already been integrated into the library. So like you can just pass the some hyperparameter setup. For example, uh, you may see some uh, setup like zero stage, like zero one, zero two, zero three, and then you have those kind of config and you just launch distributed training. So that's basically like uh, how we usually use, like if we use the hacking phase library. Um, but on the other hand, there's a, a, another one which is called Magtron. Uh, I think Magtron is a, a more like powerful like pre-training uh, library we can use. Like basically, like mostly mo uh, most of the, the the open source models training libraries are constructed based on the Magtron LM, and it's it will be more efficient and more stable than the deep speed uh, when combined with hacking feed. I think that's probably the reason why you know when training uh very large skills of uh, models, people usually tend to use Magtron LM. Um, but again, uh, these two libraries are, are, are pretty uh, are widely used. Uh, you could just try some uh, deep speed example with Hugging Face Library, I think. Um, and, and I'll just briefly talk about the parallelism because uh, this is kind of related to the uh, infrastructure and uh, um, I think it's quite important, at least so you may know uh, like some high level idea of this kind of parallelism. So I may not have like uh, much time to cover every details, but just want to give you an overview of this kind of parallelism. So basically the first parallelism is called like data parallel. So basically that's very straightforward, right? So if you have a very large training corpus, you can just divide, say you have like eight GPUs, you can just like divide your training data uh, by eight, right? And then you just have a, a shirt, uh, like eight shirt of your training corpus. And then you can just train train them on each device and then you just synchronize at the end of each training step. So that's basically how the data parallel works. Um, but one, one drawback of data parallel is basically like, okay, you, you need to still like have different copy of the models on different devices. Um, which means if your model size is pretty large, see we want to train a 70 B model. So you cannot like fit a single model into a single GPU, even though the most powerful one, like NVIDIA H100 is still like only has like 
8 gig dash GPU memory, and you cannot like feed a 70 B model into a single GPU. Um, so then we will basically have like the so-called like tensor parallel and pipeline parallel. So for the tensor parallel, uh, it means each tensor, so we know like all of the operations are tensors operations, right? So each tensor is split up into module trunks. So instead of having the whole tensor um, on a single GPU, each shard of the tensor just, you know, is distributed on its, uh, like uh, multiple GPUs. And during the processing, uh, each shard just get processed separately in parallel on different GPUs. And the results are synchronized at the end of the step. Um, and for the pipeline parallel, it basically means, okay, the model is split up vertically. So uh, maybe they have like different kinds of layers. So we can just, you know, split up this model into different layers, uh, like split the, the, distribute the different layers onto different devices across multiple GPUs. Um, that means only one or several layers of the model are placed on a single GPU and each GPU just process you know, in parallel uh, different stages of the pipeline. So for example, maybe on some layers, uh, you are just at the end of the, the your, 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 your model layers. And um, maybe for, for on those kind of devices, the model just do maybe just do the, say the, the, the final uh, next token prediction. But on some layers, just on, you just maybe some embedding layers at the beginning and you just, you know, process the next batch of data for, for that. So that's basically how the pipeline parallel works. And finally, um, like, like I just mentioned, um, like the, like the deep speed library just use the so-called like the zero redundancy optimizer or the zero. And there's typical, uh, three cities, uh, of the, the zero, there are one, there are two and there are three. So you may also, uh, like, have things um like in the transformer libraries or the deep speed library, and it just it, it will also have some other uh kinds of setup like offline your hyper parameters or something or op like all like offline your 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 training states or, or optimizer those kind of thing. So what does it mean? So basically, the the zero strategy also can the you know combine these different kinds of parallelism. And for example, it's, it's performance sharding the tensor somewhat similar to, to the tensor parallelism, but it's, it's more advanced in a more advanced way. And, and for the different kind of zero stages, for example, for the zero one, it basically means, okay, can we just, you know, uh, like divide the, the, the states, the training states across uh, different devices. And for the zero two, it basically means, okay, can we further divide the gradients. And for the zero three, it just means, okay, we divide everything, including the model layers, uh, like the training states as well as the gradients. Yeah, so uh, I mean, I'll have time to cover the, the details, but just give you uh, a brief overview of this kind of parallelism. Um, and then it's, we, we, we will just say, okay, then we have this kind of training library and we also know like how, how can we train the model with this kind of parallelism. And this is a loss curve um, of Lama one model. Um, so as we can see from this training law, so again, so all of, so uh, even though the, the, the Lama uh, like 33B and 65B may slightly have a different training corpus, because here they said like they were trained on 1.4 training tokens, but the smaller models were trained on 1.0 training tokens, but uh, it's kind of comparable. So if you can like, check out this curve, you'll find like, if you increase your uh, model size or you have like large skew, um, basically you will have like lower training loss. Um, and another interesting I want to mention for this graph is basically like, you may find um, some weird training loss curve. For example, there's kind of a stack uh, on some third and training step. And we already call this kind of the loss back or training loss back. Um, the, the training loss back was caused, maybe caused by, you know, different kinds of uh, reasons. For example, maybe at that point, there are some like bad data points, or maybe, you know, there are some related to your like, like norm, maybe their norms or some other like norm strategies. And it could also be, you know, related to your like initialization, uh, initialization of the hyper, uh, of the parameters. 
Um, and people develop different kinds of heuristic ways to kind of deal with this loss back. But during, if you find your loss back during some fine tuning, so fine tuning also will, sometimes we'll also see the loss back. Uh, if you find, if you observe loss back in your training um, experience, you may, if it just like go to normal late, lately, maybe you don't need to care about them in general, uh, generally. But sometimes if it does not like go back to normally, but instead, you know, the model just collapse, maybe, uh, a potential, uh, uh, some heuristic ways to fix it is just, you know, to go back to your uh, previous checkpoint and adjust your learning rate a bit or just skip that uh, certain steps so that you just have a more stable training. But definitely if you are interested, in, there are some theoretical analysis work around this and people find, you know, uh, have some deeper analysis on this. The second question is uh, that the points that you are the second one? Like the the initialization of your embedding vectors. Yeah, that's the third one. Uh, what's the third one? Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, gradient norms. Yeah, yeah, something related to the gradient norms. So just your 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 clip, uh, your your gradient clips have parameters will kind of resolve the issue to some extent. In some cases. I don't think I've actually covered gradient clipping yet, which is a kind of an important detail. Uh huh. You, you didn't mention that, did you? Oh, I don't. I thought you yeah. covered that. So, <laughs> so grad, yeah, gradient clipping is um, when you have your gradients. Um, if they're too big, they can result in instability. So, what you do is you divide by the minimum um, of the norm. Or is, if the norm is greater than one, you divide by the norm, basically. Um, and what that allows you to do is it allows you to reduce the norm of the gradient to be no greater than one. So it, it maintains stability in your training. Um, and so if you, like in the hyperparameters, that was listed as one hyperparameters. Yeah, here. So there's gradient clamping. Uh which is that to be 1.0. There's a lot of things to know about these things. I tried to mention all of them, but <laughs> like, uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here. So that was uh, another one that I think, yeah. Yeah, again, like if you have some opportunity, just try your own uh, instead of you know, just reading the, this kind of papers or listen to my lecture. You can, if if you have some real training experience, you will definitely like have a better understanding about like what, what do these hyperparameters mean in the real setup? Uh, but anyway, um, yeah, so then I'll just briefly talk about the skating loss. So you may have heard about this term, uh, like have been mentioned multiple times in, in, in everywhere. Like basically, if we have developed some math formulas, we can just directly predict, like if we scale up the model size, we can just directly predict the, the test loss or the training loss. So that's basically how people usually talk about it. And I think modern LMs are, at least for now, like most of them are built on the skating loss. So basically people just do a bunch of experiments on smaller uh, size of models, and then they just use this kind of skating loss to predict how larger models will behave. This is quite important because like, you know, even for those kind of big tech or like, uh, if they have very like high resources or many GPUs, they still don't want to you know waste this kind of thing. Maybe for training larger models, you just want to do it once or twice. So that means um, it's quite important that we can just predict what is the performance of this larger model uh, using the smaller model's performance. So that's basically why OpenAI people, or maybe also as well as uh, Google people, develop this kind of skating loss. So basically in the high level skating law say, okay, if we scale up our compute, uh, which can be measured by some metrics, which usually like the T-flops or here is a PF days. Um, that's basically means, okay, like how many like uh, flop operations we have in total. Uh, and another factor is the data set size, like we mentioned in the previous size, right? For the Llama model, Llama one model, um, it adopted like 1.4 trillion tokens. And definitely, you know, for like later models training, they have, for example, for the Llama 3, they have like 15 training tokens. Uh, so data size is definitely one of the most important factors. 
And another factor is the parameter size. Um, uh, like we also covered that, right? We have a 7B model. We also have like 70B model. So that's basically what we mean by parameter size. And the question here is like, given constraint compute bar rate measuring uh, flops or T-flops, uh, what would be the optimal combination of bottle size, training data size that is used to the lowest training losses? Um, and people just, you know, do this kind of uh, experiments and try to fit a curve uh, utilizing a smaller model's performance to kind of predict the, the performance or the training loss of the of larger models. Uh, and there are some math formula here, and you may see, okay, there are, are different, uh, like a bunch of notations here, but in the high level, we just say, okay, this kind of scaling loss are just re relate to like the three factors, N, D, e, and C. So N is like the, 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 the data size, the, the, the data size size, um, and, uh, sorry, D, N is, uh, the number of parameters and, uh, D is, a uh, uh like the the size of the, or your 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 training data size and C is your 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 flops or your your model compete and basically they just kind of like do the like the 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 model training on smaller models and utilizing these models to kind of feed a curve and then then they get this constant and then they can have this kind of uh formula and then they can utilize this formula to predict okay what if we train a very large scale model what is the predict uh, training losses. So that's basically uh, what we mean by scaling loss. Um, uh, I, may cover, I may explain a little bit about these two curves. For example, uh, in the left of figures, uh, like, it's, like it's called loss, or, uh, loss versus model and data size size. So the X axis is the tokens in the data size, uh, in the data side. And we have like different lines, which represent different hyperparameters or different size of models, you know, ranging from say the um, three hundred ninety three point two thousand to you know seven hundred um, and eight million parameters. And basically, you know, we just vary the tokens in the data size, and then we just record the the loss of this kind of the, the models, and then we can just kind of feed a curve to to uh to to kind of predict what if we train the a larger model on these certain of tokens. Uh, and similar on the rough figures, right? And we have loss versus model size and training steps and the X axis is, is the training steps. Yep. Right, so you could, yeah. So the question is like, how accurate is the scaling law? So like usually the skin law is kind of accurate, I would say, because you can see roughly see from this figure. So like there are two lines here, if, if you can tell, and basically one line is the real line and one line is kind of the fake line. And you can see like, we, we kind of predict the, 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 the larger scale models performance. There, there are some big caveats here though. Like this is predicting this is predicting the perplexity or the log likelihood on a held out data set that's very similar to the training set. Um, and it's, it's within one model architecture, it's with the same data set. So if you vary any of those parameters, suddenly it will not become good at predicting. But as long as you're keeping everything constant other than those three variables, then it would be good. Right, I think Grant mentioned a very good point. So when you do this kind of scaling loss prediction, you you must control your other factors. For example, the even though we here we have the 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 size of your training data set, but that does not mean that you can change your data mixture ratio. So basically, we can still like keep the same distribution of your training data set, but just vary the tokens in this data size. So that's kind of important. Say if you just change a you know to another data mixture. Then like the skinning laws or like the 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 curve you, you feed won't work. So yep. So, so I just have a question about the data right? but because I remember the most recent paper, the mm -hmm. Mama 3.1, mm -hmm. they mentioned a new concept called the dense model. So they use the 2.5 trillion tokens to train the 70 model. And and they uh, according to their uh, survey, they, they they claim that it seems like uh, uh, there's still the, the current scaling law may have, may 
have some still improvement over there because they because of, according to a previous scaling law the 2.5 trillion token data set is way more than the, the way we, way more than the requirements of the seven billion dollar we get yeah so so i'm not pretty sure is this the yeah so so let me clarify there was a very um there was a very influential paper called uh, chinchilla which basically um was talking about the uh compute optimal like printing compute optimal models. And the idea behind this was given a certain amount of compute, what's the ideal size for a model that you're going to be training? Um, and based on this, you can derive, like we have a certain amount of compute, what, what is the best model that we could train given this compute? And um, for Meta, Meta used this to derive the fact that given that they were going to be able to train for a certain amount of compute, the best thing to do would be to train a 405 billion parameter model um, for uh, for 15 trillion tokens. Like they knew how much compute they had and they decided that that would be the optimal model. Mm -hmm. The problem is though, that might be the optimal model for Meta, but it might not be the optimal model for somebody who wants to run a model on their laptop, right? Because 405 billion parameters is too much and I can't run it on my laptop. So. You might also want a smaller model that's not compute optimal for the amount of training data that you have. And because of that, you can train a 7D model for 15 trillion parameters. That's not as good as the 405 billion parameter model, but it's better for deploying on like smaller hardware or, or better inference type. So um, just because something is quote unquote compute optimal with respect to the amount of accuracy you can get doesn't mean it's optimal from like other perspectives. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I need to like go to the next part because we still have a lot of things to discuss. Um, so yeah, but feel free to ask any question offline. Um, and then, yeah, so since we uh, talked about all of things regarding the pre-training, uh, and then we just mainly talked about some represent language models and also, but before that, we just first covered the topic of uh, like open models versus closed models. So basically, um, you know, there are like four aspects when we talk about the open source and closed source. Uh, the, the first one is the weights, and second one is the inference code, and then the training code, and then the data part, right? So for example, for the for the llama, it just basically just release the model weights. So maybe it's more accurate just call it open weights model instead of open source, because it does not like release the training code or, or, or the training data. Uh, and I think when we, uh, and, and but for, for some models, they, 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 they like release everything. And for example, later on, we just talked about the OBO models, which is trained by AI2 uh, people, and they just released everything, including their training code data and weights. So we basically call those kind of thing open source model more accurately. But most of the, currently, most of the open source model actually is open weights model. So. Uh, that's the concept of open um, versus closed access. Um, and there are also uh, like different lessons, licenses and permissiveness. Um, for example, we have like public domain, MIT, Apache, DPL, uh, CCNC, and Lama, and also no lessons. So it's just this kind of lessons just give you, you know, different kinds of constraints or restrictions when you, you know, downloading, uh, like using or deploying your models in different cases. And mo in, for most of the academia uses, we, we usually use the MIT lesson or Apache lesson because it's relatively loose and if we want to release something, but it also depends on like other situations. Um, and, and Lama has its own lessons in which kind of has some restriction, for example, for the Lama 3, it just has like a, a, a line saying that you, when you fine tune your model based on the Lama 3 base model, you have to add Lama 3 before your models, uh, your model name. So that's, Oops. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, so that's basically the, 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 the different licenses and permissiveness. Um, and another thing is about the fair use. So fair use is 
basically say, okay, uh, like, uh, like when you utilizing some corporate material, if you are using it under some circumstances or some situation, it might be okay. So for example, if you're just like utilizing a small portion of the original material or data, it might be okay if just utilizing for the educational purpose or research purpose. Um, and some other cases, like uh, for example, if the the use cases uh, do not diminish com com commercial value, um, it might be possible. Or okay, and um, and but you know most of the data on the internet right now is kind of copyrighted, so model training is currently dying, assuming fair use. So this this kind of a, a gray area. So we. On the one hand, people say, okay, maybe we can directly utilize the wipe data. But on the other hand, some people say no. So there are still like a lot of copyright stuff associated with the data. So for example, like, like recently we saw like different lawsuits. For example, one of the most famous one is the New York Times just sued the OpenAI and the Microsoft um, for using their like copyright data for training the models. Um, yeah, so I mean, like th this is kind of important if you do a very large scale training, um, but within the academia use or research purpose, it's really fine. But again, when you're utilizing some training data, you may need to check out what lessons uh, they are using and you must you, you might want to obey their, their rules. Um, so um, then we, we want to ask, so why like, people want to restrict the model access instead of directly, you know, releasing all of the things to the public. Uh, I mean, the first one is just a commercial concern, right? Because they just train the model. They just want to make mon money from the model. They just want to, they just don't want to just donate the model to the public, but instead just want to make some commercial values. So that's most, that's probably the, 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 the most likely reason they don't want to release like their training data and the code and even the, the, the model themselves. And the second reason is the safety, right? Because like we know there are a lot of safety issues of carbon language models and people just develop, you know, a lot of maybe uh, like, for example, the geo breaks, those kind of thing to try to, you know, they say some harmful uh, output from the model. So there are a bunch of safety issues with the models. And the, 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 the third part, the, the, the legal thing, right? As we talk about the copyright thing, and sometimes when they train the model on some copyright stuff, maybe, you know, directly like releasing the training data is kind of risky. Um, and then we'll just talk about some, like some open, some English centric open models. Cause most of the, why we call the English centric? Cause most of the, Firstly, most of the training corpus are, are English. And secondly, like most of the models are intended for English use only. So that's the reason why we, we want to call it English centric open models. Um, yeah, so we will basically cover five different kinds of models in this class. So uh, for, for, for the first categories, like fully open source or re reproducible, like it's just open source everything, we will talk about two models. Um, one is Pythia, um, which is like trained by user AI people. And the other one is the OMO, which is trained by the AI2 people. Uh, and then we will talk about the open width model, um, like definitely the Llama series, uh, Llama 1, 2, 3, 3.1, and also the, the, the Mistral model, um, and finally the Queen model. Um, so for the Pythia model, basically, uh, it was trained. It was created by user AI, and uh, they just wanted to train a fully op open source model, uh, like for for different model sizes. Um, they have like eight model sizes, uh, ranging from like seventy million to twelve billion, uh, and they also release the the kind of the middle training checkpoint to the public, so that you know people can just do different kinds of research exploration based on this kind of intermediate results or intermediate checkpoints. And for the architecture, I think they just follow Llama architecture. And, and uh, for the data, they just trained on like around like 300 billion token of the, the pile. So the, the, the training data is called the pile. And we'll briefly talk about the, the in the next slide. Uh, and their training by size is 2 million. 
um, with the learning rates like 1.2 E minus four. So, I mean, still a relatively large training corpus, though not that large, uh, I mean, training batch size. Um, that still like echoes to my previous point. Like when you do the pre-training, you may want to utilize a relatively large training batch size. So the PAL is kind of a, a data site constructed from different open source and also including also some efforts from their own. And basically it contains, you know, like the, the common crawl thing and also some web tags, exchange, Wikipedia, and also some archive, PubMed, and some free law and also some books, um, subtitles, and so on and so forth. So it's basically like 800 gigabytes data set utilized for the pre-training. And also definitely contains some code. Um, Okay, so for the findings, basically, um, the the first insights like they they found like definitely with larger training data size and the larger models, the 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 performance are just you know, uh, gets better and better. But another interesting thing they 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 found is like okay, larger models tend to memorize files more quickly. Um, and here the the figure shows uh so the x axis is a fact frequency um and the 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 legends are different training steps and basically we can see okay with larger like size of models like the 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 models can like memorize the facts uh, very very quickly so that's also again echo to our previous interesting topic right like the models are really good at memorizing facts, but not that good at like generalizing to I think stuff. Um, so, and then- I also wanted to add something uh, that if the, the, the effects are more apparent when you go above the 1 billion. Uh -huh. So 2 billion, 2.8 billion and above, that's where like the actual frequencies of facts start to be fully utilized by the model. So like anything below one billion doesn't really do much. Do much memorization. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, okay, so uh Lin Tang is like one of the user AI teams people previously. <laughs> So he, he might know more. Do you have any questions about the paper you have discussed? <laughs> you can just yeah. 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 So he definitely like knew much more about idea or this kind of training than me. So definitely if you have any question about idea and maybe some other potential evaluation thing about the user AI, you can just directly ask him. But what will in town just said, okay, for the like model size, which is smaller than one billion, and actually the model is not very good at memorizing the facts, but when you like Continually increase the model size, the model starts to memorize facts more easily. Yep. Uh, what's the y-axis? Uh, y-axis is, I think it's a, the, the facts memorizing rate or yeah, something. The, the the, yeah, the facts accuracy prediction or something like that. Cool. Uh, and then I'll just talk about the OMO. So OMO is, is a, a open source model trained by AI2 people. And it's the goal is like to like have a, a better, a study the science of language model. Like how can we like train a better language model and uh, by open source everything. Um, and uh, for the architecture still similar to Llama architecture. And for the uh, data, they just trained on like 2.4 2.46 trillion tokens of domo corpus, which will be covered in the next slide. And for other training setups, they just use three minus four with like four million training batch size. So for for the doma is kind of a, a, a kind of an important pre-training corpus. So it contains like three T pre-training tokens constructing from like different kind of uh, sources, um, like the common crawl, the stack, C4, Reddit, uh, PS2, uh, Gutenberg books, Wikipedia, and so on and so forth. And they also develop a, a, a data, pre-training data pipeline to kind of you know, construct the pre-training data. So a standard pre-training data pipeline usually contains 
the different kind of filterings. For example, here they they did like the language filtering, quality filtering, content filtering. So that's the first step. And then the second step, people usually like do the deduplication. Um, so basically, people found that. So there are a lot of bunch of study found that if you just repeat some training tokens for multiple times, uh, you just get uh, not that good performance. Um, so basically, when we do the pre-training, we always want to just do the deduplication um, so that, you know, for most of the training tokens, it's just saying for one time. But recently, people also found like repeating some 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 certain covers, for example, for the Wikipedia or the books could, like you know, have better performance. But generally, you people just do the deduplication for their training corpus in their uh, in this kind of data pipeline, pre-training data pipeline. And also, they're just do different kinds of data mixture or multi-source mixing. Um, and finally, do, uh, do the tokenization. So the tokenization usually happens before um, before the training starts. So basically, that means um, we just want to first like utilizing the CPU to do the tokenization, uh, and after tokenization, we just launch the training. So that's really how people did. Um, and there are there are some findings, and you may just refer to OMO papers. Uh, but first, they generally they achieved uh, competitive average performance compared with, for example, Llama models uh, at that time. Uh, and also, the people found like with more token things, um, the downstream task performance um, has been improved. So. Um, uh, and more recently, OMO has a like a, 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 a mixture of experts version, which is called OMO E, and we will cover the mixture of experts in later classes. Um, and then we we previously talked about Lamo Lama one, and here I just want to talk about Lamo two and Lamo uh, Lama three. Um, and for the architecture, Lama two. Uh, was near the same as number one, and but instead for the training data, it has more tokens. So it has up to um, two training tokens. And for the training, the training setup is kind of the same as the previous. Um, and for the Lama 3.1, um, so that's uh, the that was released more recently. And the, the goal is like Meta want, wanted to develop a herd of language models that native support uh, multilingual coding, reasoning, and to usage. So that's the four aspects they highlighted. And compared with Lama 2, the training data skew uh, you know, increased a lot. Like basically in Lama 2, they have like around two training tokens, but in Lama 3, they have like 15 training tokens. Um, and also, they are including some like multilingual tokens, not just English. Um, like and definitely they are they are there were more training flops um, or like more training compute utilized to train this model, uh, which is kind of like fifty times larger than the like the the, the largest version of Lama two, which basically like the Lama two seventy p or something like that. Um, and here's the table, and you could see. They basically trained the Lama 3 with like 8,000 8, 8, GPUs or even like 16,000 GPUs. So which is really quite large to kind of do this kind of pre-training. Um, but definitely again, they like Lama 3.1 leads to better performance. And another thing Lama 3.1 highlighted in their report is the multimodality. Um, and we will have a class, mainly talk about the multimodality later, but here I just want to give you a quick overview. So basically, uh, Lama 3.1 uh, not only support text, but also support the image, video, uh, and speech uh, as input. So their architecture is a little bit complex, but if you um, take a close look, you'll find like they, like in the high level, they still adopted like encoder, uh, decoder approaches for the multimodalities. So for example, for the image and video, they have like, like different encoders and then they just transform, they just do some linear transformation uh, and like then fit into the image encoder. 
and they just got the image representation, um, and then just combine the image representation with the text. And similar for the for the speech as well, they basically just have the speech encoder and then you know encode the speech into the like different representations and then combine with the token embeddings. So and then they have a, a language decoder and just basically just output the, the text token. And they will also have some video uh, decoder maybe. Uh, I'm not sure whether whether they they, they plot it in the figure or possible no. Yeah, maybe in this figure they just just have the the text token as the only output, but it may potentially support the video generation or image generation, but it may not cover in this image. So I don't know. Um, then here's a, a like figure that comprehensively com compare Llama, uh, Llama 2 and Llama 3. So, I mean, from the architecture, they're nearly the same. Um, it's uh, like, except, you know, like in Lama 2, they started to uh, adopt GQA, like the group attention uh, we just talked about, group query attention we just talked about, um, which kind of saves the, 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 the memory as well as to have faster inference speed. Uh, and another thing in Lama 3 is like they use a larger vocabulary size. Uh, as you could see for the Lama 1, Lama, Lama 2, the token vocabulary size is like uh, 32,000 tokens, but in Lama 3, they have like 128,000 uh, tokens. So uh, a good thing for increasing the, the vocabulary size is like you will like have fewer tokens uh, after tokenization, uh, which could be, you know, have like better accuracy of your prediction and which kind of leads to better performance. Um, and then I'll just briefly talk about some other models. Uh, one is the, the Mistral and the Mixtral. So basically it's just constructed by Mistral AI. Um, and uh, uh, there are some, some different things. For the training data, they may not disclose. Uh, not for the training data, we may not know details. But for the architecture, the in the mixture one in the earlier version, they kind of highlighted this kind of sliding window attention. So I'm not sure whether they still adopted in their later version. But in early version, they just have this kind of sliding window attention. And the high level idea is kind of like in order to you know um, effectively handle the long context sequences as input. You know, if we directly do the attention over all of the tokens, it might just, you know, give the, the, um, the like the two larger memory consume and also like, uh, like much more time complexity. So they basically have this kind of sliding window attention, which it basically means that we have kind of a effective context sense. We just slide this kind of window and just do the, uh, the, the tension within this, this, slide, this sliding window. And, and the final model, uh, open source, open waste model is the, the queen model, which is created by Alibaba. And uh, it, they also support the, the multi-lingo, I think, uh, though especially it was intended for Chinese. Um, but they also have larger vocabulary uh, in order to have better multilingual support. Um, and here is a like a graph showing like their multilinguality uh, like on different languages. The y-axis just represent the token compression rates um, and the x-axis that is kind of different languages. Um, and you could see like their, their multilingual performance is relatively better than the others. Um, oh, I forgot like to mention in the previous slide. So, uh, we also like talk about this small LM, which is constructed by hugging face people recently. Um, and this, uh, and they, they have, all of these models are, are smaller skills. Um, they have like three sizes, uh, like one, 135 million, uh, 360 million, and 1.5 billion parameters. And they are fully open source with high quality pre-training corpus. And there are three training pre-training corpus that they use. One is the Cosmos PDA V2, what is kind of a synthetic data um, generated by Mixtral. And the other two is one is like the Python EDU, um, which is kind of educational Python samples from the stack. And the other one is like FanWeb EDU, um, which is kind of educational web samples from FanWeb. 
So I'll just briefly talk about the FanWeb or FanWeb EDU. So FanWeb contains like more than 15 trillion tokens of clean and deduplicate English web data from Common Crawl. And again, they have like this kind of standard pipeline as maybe kind of similar to the to the to the to to the OMO um training data as we introduced earlier. Um uh, and they actually find like after like like adopting this kind of filtering uh methods, they will just lead to a, a, a much more clean training corpus, which kind of leads to better pre-training um uh, performance and they also have a subset which is called FanWeb EDU. So basically just utilizing just develop an educational quality classifier using annotations generated by LAM370 being struck. And they just utilizing this classifier to return only the most educational web pages. And they just found okay the FanWeb EDU the data quality is much better than the others. Yeah, there are definitely some other code models uh, from Stock Coder, Code Llama, DPC Coder, and all on more recently, um, there's a coder called eCoder, which is developed by their one AI, which is kind of a smaller skew, but strong performance. Um, and we'll just cover more in the code generation class. And for the math model, we have Lima models, which is kind of constructed by um, eLuther AI. Uh, and other people. And, and also we have DeepSeek math, which is kind of uh, like pre-trained by DeepSeek. Uh, and we will also cover more in the code and math class again. And for the science model, um, like previously meta trained a like model called Galatica. So basically it's just trained on diverse of like science corpus, including, you know, the some chemical or some uh, like DNA sequence or, or some other thing. I think maybe we can skip the post models. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank, thanks, everyone. Um, and uh, we can take any questions out front. Um, yeah. But...